Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this class on uh, understanding the prophetic, which is what we're doing first. Uh, and then, of course, we will be touching on the apostolic ministry. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Uh, I'll lead in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, this great opportunity, Lord, that we can study the word of God, Father, we can understand, uh, Father God, uh, your heart behind the prophetic ministry. Lord, we thank you that uh, you are equipping us. And Lord, this is our prayer that, uh, Lord, the power of the Spirit, Lord, that it will be released uh, from our lives. And God, that mighty works will be done, Father God, for the glory of your name. Lord, even as we uh, sit under this teaching and hear the word, Lord, I pray that uh, you will stir us up, oh God. Yes, Father God, we, we want to be stirred up, Lord. Let the work of the Spirit continue in our hearts, Father. We receive it by faith. We speak a blessing, oh God, uh, upon these sessions and everyone who's a part of these sessions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, before we get into uh, today's topic about the prophetic in the Old Testament. Uh, I just want to hear from us if there was something new that you picked up in the last class, if there was a thought or a concept which you thought, oh, wow, I, I didn't know that. Uh, so it will be nice if you could share, and we will continue from there. So basically, we uh, talked about what the prophetic means, the prophetic progression. We also looked at how God communicated uh, to his prophets in uh, days past. And we saw how some uh, the process that some uh, receive a word more in a visual manner, whereas uh, some others may receive it in a sort of a uh, inspired manner. So these were broadly uh, the, the main concepts that we touched on. Yes, Jeffina, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I loved how we studied that there is a difference between a prophesying believer, prophecy ministry, and office of the prophecy. Uh, that was something uh, different for me, something that I never knew. And uh, and I also loved how we started the class, like when you asked why prophetic ministry? I was thinking about so many things, but then you just said, because our God speaks, that's a very simple answer, because our God speaks. Um, so, yeah, these are things that stood out to me. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, any any other thoughts? Uh, the others can step in if you would like to. Anything that you picked up that touched you in the last class? All right. So let's continue. I'm sure um, you know God will keep adding to the truth that uh, we have learned so far. Uh, please follow along uh, by using the. APC publication, Understanding the Prophetic. So now we will move to chapter two in that publication. It's called Prophetic Ministry in the Old Testament. So uh, God, we said that he is speaking God. He's always spoken in just past. He continues to speak to us today. But how is it that he has spoken uh, in, in the Old Testament, or in the Old Testament. And it's not just about speaking, but we are looking at the prophetic, the prophetic, which uh, includes includes communication from God, and uh, many uh, different things, you know, even discernment that God grants. So broadly, the, the, uh, the broad uh, prophetic gifts as well. So how did all of this work under the Old Testament is our question. See, one of the important things that uh, we all need for our lives is guidance. So even in the Old Testament, we find people uh, going to God to get answers. God, what should we do? 
how should we approach a certain enemy or uh, what are you saying in these circumstances these these are the questions people had and they always reach, reached out to god to find the right answer so uh, how is it that god revealed his heart to the people there are a primary way that we see uh, uh, in the old testament is through the urim and the thummim okay so what are these things you know urim and uh, thummim basically what god told moses is he gave him an instruction to make these priestly garments and on the breastplate right uh, he he said that you've got to put some stones known as urim and thummim and these will help in god specifically sharing what he wants done to the people so how exactly would god use the urim and thummim these these questions are asked urim and thummim are generally interpreted as lights and perfections or also known as revelation and truth so uh, what could have happened is that god could have somehow directed the priest as he stood before god uh, as maybe some you know light shown on uh, either the urim or the thummim to say okay yes you can go ahead or no you can't go ahead this is right and uh, that is wrong so maybe some sort of a reflection on these stones uh, could have uh, spoken to the priest and then he communicated that message to the people or uh, it is also said that you know they would put these stones in a pouch and then ask god god what is your your uh, decision and then god would as they retrieve a, a particular uh, stone they would know hey it's a yes from god or it's a no from god so this is the manner in which you know, people went about inquiring of the lord so you see the use of the urim and thummim uh, quite a bit in the old testament by various people okay, various people at different points but today as we look at our own lives uh, we don't do this anymore you know like some people say uh, things like bible cricket um, where uh, you just open the bible and then if god points you to a positive scripture then he's saying yes or if he's pointing you to a negative scripture then he's saying no so you know we don't try to hear from god like that and uh, uh, we don't do things like okay if if um, you know some small um, pleas before god you know, put it out there and then uh, if god does this then you know he's saying go ahead or if he's not doing uh, that then he's saying don't go ahead so we, we don't try to get our answers in that way or even uh, what i said about you know retrieving uh, a particular uh, a stone or in, in the bible times we know that people used to cast lots even when they threw jonah in the water that was a common practice because they believed that god would speak even through that and probability as they pick that what uh, one name god's decision will be made clear to them. but today we won't depend on things like this because we see in scripture you know, in colossians 3 15 it talks about the peace of god the peace of god in our hearts which is the best indicator so uh, how do we know how does the new testament believer or uh, the new covenant believer know what the holy spirit is saying or god is saying we go by the peace in our hearts right so as we are walking with the lord um, we know the holy spirit will pour in peace if it is the right direction that we are taking or uh, it might be the other way around if it's not in line with what god wants us to do we might find that we're feeling very disturbed and it's not just about an emotional um, anxiety or disturbance but deep in our spirit there is an unrest and so the peace of god is like an umpire it's like our current day human through which god guides us and shows us the direction so i hope uh, you're all with me we are trying to pick up uh, a couple of uh, insights from the way God communicated in the Old Testament. So it's a journey, okay? Uh, and uh, we will look at 
the different ways that were used. So the first one is, of, of course, you remember them, but we don't really use it anymore. Uh, what else? What else do we see in the Old Testament? We also see that a popular way in which people got a word from God was through a prophet. Okay, remember we discussed the seer, uh, Roe, Jose, Nabi. There were prophets uh, in those times who were anointed by God, and they would hear from God. And that was how a common person, a normal person would uh, want to hear from God. So if they wanted to know something, they would seek out a prophet and uh, go ask them, you know, hey, what should we do? So we know that uh, in, in the book of Samuel, you see great examples of this. So I'll quickly read from 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. It says, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, come, let us go to the seer. Remember, they called the prophet the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was uh, formerly called the called a seer. Okay, so uh, that's uh, outside of um, uh, the passage. Anyway, you uh, understand that uh, the prophet or the seer was your best connect to God, and it was customary to uh, reach out to a prophet. So again, there are examples. We said that um, Saul. When he lost his donkeys, you know, he uh, went to the seer, and there Samuel told him where the donkeys were. But he uh, shared much more than just where the donkeys were, but regarding the plan of God for Saul's life. Uh, there is another time where we see, you know, certain kings they approach Elisha. Okay, so they come to Elisha and uh, they uh, want to know, oh, how do we go into battle? So then Elisha seeks the Lord and then he reveals the heart of God to uh, the people. So this is the manner in which uh, you know the uh, uh, inquiry uh, unto the Lord was made. Now, if you compare it to today's times, you know many believers ask this question: uh, Should I go to a prophet? I am going to make a big decision in my life. Uh, maybe I should uh, seek out a powerful man of God or a powerful uh, woman of God, and they will be able to uh, communicate what God wants me to do. But you see, this is more like an Old Testament. Um, uh, Old Testament, uh, how do I, what do I say for this? Like the primary way in which people heard from God in the Old Testament was through a prophet. Okay, but that is not the primary way in which God speaks to us today. So when we have to make decisions, even uh, big decisions in life that can, uh, you know, change the course of our lives, it is not necessary to hear from a prophet. Okay, so note the words. I'm saying it's not the primary way. So would it be wrong to uh, then hear from a prophet at all? Not at all. If over and above God's direction to us in a personal way is confirmed by a word from a prophet, thank God for that. But that's not how uh, we are going to make the big decisions of our lives. We don't need a prophet every time to come and tell us, you know, who to marry, where to live, which ministry to do, which city to work in. No, we don't need uh, a prophet for that. But what do we have right now as uh, believers, you know, after the cross, believers, the Bible, uh, it says, Romans chapter. Eight, that you know we have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we talked about peace. That is an empire in our hearts, as Colossians 3.15 says. But we also have the witness of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. When we are making a decision, the Holy Spirit is able to help us and guide us. You know, again, that sense of, hey, this is the best decision to make, or that sense of something is wrong. You know, Even though everything looks good on the outside, something is wrong with this particular decision. The Holy Spirit can communicate directly to a believer. So we primarily rely 
on the guidance of God's word and his spirit. In addition to that, if at all a, a prophet speaks over our lives and confirms something, it's, you know, uh, it, what do you say? It, it's like a bonus. Okay. But like the Old Testament, we don't have to go and uh, run behind prophets to make decisions in our lives. Uh, I really hope that uh, it's clear and helpful. At any point, if you have questions, please uh, interrupt. You can. It, it's best actually for you to unmute and ask me because I'm looking at the notes. So sometimes I there's a delay in me noticing the chat comments. OK, so let's move on. So what is the most important test of an authentic prophetic word let's say a prophetic word has been released okay and how would we know if that word is uh, really from god so when i say it's genuine it's authentic it's really from god okay how do we know that so in the old testament there is something that god uh, instructed Okay, regarding the prophetic word. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Uh, if one of you can turn to this passage and read it, that will be very helpful. Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5, please. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 to 5. Yeah. Uh, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or the dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Divya, for reading that passage. So as we can see, um, we... We are talking about a prophet who gave a prophetic word. And what happens is the word comes to pass. Or in other words, it's done. It's fulfilled. Okay, But even when it is fulfilled, what is God saying? Okay, You should not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. So notice the fulfillment. Somebody, because in our understanding, prophecy or prophetic word is just that. Someone said something that has happened. Wow. It's authentic. It's genuine. It is from God. That's how we assess it. But you see the uh, instruction that God is giving. God is saying the quality of the word okay should also be considered it's not just the fulfillment of the word so here the dreamer of dreams or the prophet what what uh, did they prophesy they said let us go after other gods so the prophetic word in itself the nature of that prophetic word is taking people away from god though it is fulfilled it is taking people away from God. So that kind of a word is not honored by God. So no wonder you know, God is actually warning the people and saying, don't just go by a word being fulfilled, but see whether that word is drawing you closer to me or not. If the prophetic word or the prophecy is taking people away from God, you know, away from honoring God in their lives, away from the plans and purposes of God for their lives, uh, it's not an authentic or a genuine prophetic word uh, as far as 
you know, this this passage is concerned. So we must test everything that is heard. Even in the Old Testament, God told the people, look, you got to look at the prophetic word. Okay, is it in harmony you know, with uh, the the revealed counsel of God so far? Right, uh, that is of primary importance as compared to whether or not that word is being fulfilled. And so the same application uh, is is helpful today. You know, we look at the integrity of the word. We look at whether or not that word is uh, aligned to the logos. Okay, the word of God. Uh, and whether it is expressing uh, the will of God, the purpose of God, uh, and drawing us closer to God or not. So uh, that is a test, actually, that uh, we must apply on every prophetic word. OK, so um, we've learned a couple of things so far. We said that you know, initially it was the Urim and Thummim, and then the prophets. That's how God communicated. But in the new uh, covenant, we have the Holy Spirit with us. We have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. We have uh, the peace of God that can help us. And also, we've seen how we must understand the uh, integrity or the quality of the prophetic word. And uh, uh, that should be above just checking whether the prophetic word is fulfilled or not. So what are some of the other insights we can gain from the Old Testament? So when it came to the prophetic word, um, we also noticed that the prophetic word was not just something that was um, spoken, um, you know, like like um, like like a prose, okay, so just like an essay, okay. This is how it should be every time. Thus says the Lord, uh, and uh, communicated in that manner. So you find creative expressions of the release of the prophetic word. So what do we mean by that? Now, when we read uh, the Psalms, we find so many different passages there which are written in the style of song or poetry. And it's so beautiful to notice that there is prophecy uh, in many of them. And how is it expressed? In the form of poetry or song. So you know, sometimes, um, David is uh, is writing about his own life. You know, he's saying uh, it seems like God is speaking to David that you know you will not uh, miss uh, the Lord spoke to my Lord. So many different things like that. Uh, but then those words were actually talking about the Lord Jesus. So there is that prophetic insight, even though uh, you you find that it is from a person's life or you know a person's expression. So creative forms of expressions we we notice in the old testament so we might find uh, some parables you know here and there that carry some insights in them or uh, some form of uh, uh, symbolic actions you know symbolic actions where uh, jeremiah he he does something or ezekiel is taken to some place and it's it sort of dramatized okay, Hosea's life. Uh, there is a lesson uh, to be drawn about Israel and God through the life of Hosea. So uh, there are various ways in which you know the direction and inspiration of God was brought out. Even if you consider the life of Moses, you know, Moses uh, writing a prophetic song of blessing, uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, 33, Nathan going and correcting David. See, Nathan knows that David is wrong and uh, he wants to release the word of God over David and say, hey, come on, uh, this is a mistake. Okay, You need to repent. But instead of saying, thus says the Lord, you see the creativity there? When Nathan goes, he narrates a story to David. He says, look, uh, so there was this man and he stole... Uh, the eve of another man. So he just makes this, this story and then asks David for his, uh, uh, you know, his final word on, on who's right, who's wrong. And then David says, oh, what, a, what an evil man. He should be punished. And when David says that, Nathan, you know, quickly uh, points out and says, you are that man. Because what is he doing? He's bringing correction. He's bringing the prophetic word, but he's bringing it with incredible wisdom. So uh, in the Old Testament, though somewhere we have this understanding that 
all the prophets who spoke only said, thus says the Lord, it's not true. There are uh, poems, there are songs, there uh, are insights from people's lives, there are parables, there's drama, there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, wise uh, expressions of the uh, prophetic word. And so there are many things that we can actually learn from. Uh, and God is actually speaking uh, through all of these. So that, again, is, is an insight that we can gain. Now, moving right along, uh, in the Old Testament, we also notice that there is some kind of an association of music with the release of the prophetic anointing. Uh, there is a, a particular uh, you know, incident, uh, and this is when Saul, OK, Saul, uh, uh, who was anointed by Samuel to be king, uh, we know that the anointing on Saul's life was a kingly anointing. But when Saul encountered uh, a company of prophets in 1 Samuel 10 and verse 5, what happens is it, it, it says that later on, when he encountered this company of prophets, he himself began to prophesy. So how can somebody with a different anointing okay, begin to prophesy? Uh, it's incredible. So something with the, uh, the company of prophets, and they are described as people who carried tambourine, flute, harp, uh, and, and things like that, and they were prophesying. Okay, and obviously, we learned later on that there was also some sort of uh, uh, an influence there which came upon Saul and he was prophesying. But uh, primarily, this company of prophets had a practice of incorporating music okay, along with their prophesying. So uh, there is a connection there, music and uh, prophecy. Later on, again, in the case of Elisha, there's a time in 2 Kings uh, 3 where you find uh, three kings going to Elisha the prophet and they want him to prophesy. Okay? But at that point, uh, he doesn't have a word from God. But he knows how to get a word from God. And you know what he does? He calls for a musician. So look at this scene. Elisha, he needs to speak to these kings. He doesn't have a word from God, but to get that word from God, he calls a musician. And musician, as it, he must have been uh, one of the sons of the prophets. Okay, those days they had something known as the schools of the prophets, where you had all these trainees uh, who would join to learn about the prophetic. So maybe one of those people who, again, like how we saw company of prophets with tambourine and strings and all that. So there must have been one of those trainees or students who's already used to uh, music and musical instruments. So Elisha calls one of these guys and he says, hey, uh, can you play for me? And when he starts playing, the prophetic anointing is stirred up within Elisha and you know he begins to prophesy. 2 Kings 3, verses 15 and 16, it says, Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon them, and he said, Thus says the Lord. See how it's flowing, right? So prophecy seems to be associated with music okay? uh, in, in, in some places. Uh, and uh, it seems like the prophets knew how to make use of this association. So they would have that music, and then the anointing would be stirred up, and they would start to flow in the prophetic anointing. So what can we gain from this today? Uh, we too can make use of worship. You know, of praise uh, and, and the anointing that comes with it. And definitely, you know, as, as we are flowing in those things, the prophetic anointing will also be stirred up uh, within us, in our congregations. Okay, So that's how we uh, apply it in our today's life. Uh, so let's move right along. We've seen all these things in the Old Testament. Uh, now, what else? What else can we see um, as far as the prophetic anointing is concerned? You know, the prophetic anointing 
seem right now we said music and prophetic anointing have a connection okay the next point is there seems to be uh, a connection of supernatural demonstrations with the prophetic anointing so uh, the people who carried the prophetic anointing over their lives you know, think about moses okay uh, he had some incredible experiences uh, that he walked through uh, you know he god gave him the rod he went up to pharaoh he was able to face those sorcerers uh, he raised that rod and you saw the uh, you know opening up of the uh, of the red sea so there were incredible supernatural demonstrations through the life of moses okay you could even call them like you know signs wonders and moses was walking in those things uh, because the prophetic anointing was was something that he carried now not just moses think about uh, people like um, elijah okay think about people like elisha clear cut these were all prophets of god and as we study uh, about their lives there are many many examples right similar examples like uh, moses and even new ones so you had uh, uh, a bronze okay wait a moment elisha using elijah's mantle to part the river jordan similar to what uh, uh, happened to moses you know, parting of a water body um, we see other things like uh, material items uh, even something like elisha's bones right uh, was able to raise a dead man and uh, many other miracles you know the the woman of uh, zarephath you know how god divinely provided for her when um, the prophetic word was spoken by the lord through elijah into her life uh, we also notice the healing of a man called naaman you know leprosy uh, a, a very um, in those times of course you know incurable disease uh, but these prophets the prophet elisha in this case you know, he gives him a simple instruction he says you go uh, you dip uh, seven times you know in the in the river and you will be fine so uh, this syrian king he actually follows that instruction and uh, something like leprosy leaves his body these are all supernatural demonstrations of the power of god uh, and uh, that is something that we notice through the life of Moses or Elijah, Elisha, um, and uh, even today. You know, how do we apply this uh, in our own lives? You know, if God could do uh, supernatural things, you know, just to kind of uh, summarize some of the things that happened, supernatural deliverance, people were brought out, you know, all the miracles of Moses and all that. Um, supernatural deliverance could happen miraculous childbirth could happen there were you know women who did not have children and uh, you had these prophets prophesying so supernatural miraculous childbirth or multiplication of food and oil um, or uh, causing fire to fall out of heaven uh, outrunning the chariot right physical with with the physical strength that uh, elijah had or um, something that went against nature. You had an axe head which was floating in water. Again, something supernatural, um, causing of supernatural blindness, the filling of ditches, supernatural debt cancellation, multiplication of oil in the jar. So the list is, you know, uh, sort of really long. If all those things could take place under the old covenant, through the prophetic anointing, you know, how much more? Because we know that we are in a more glorious covenant. Okay? Uh, and that is an encouragement for us that today, nothing should actually stop us from the supernatural demonstrations of God. And there is an association of the prophetic anointing with these supernatural demonstrations. So as we are growing in the flow of the prophetic, you and I can expect. If God did it in the Old uh, Testament times, he can definitely do these wonderful, miraculous things in our times as well. So I know uh, Divya asked a question in the mentoring hour. 
and her question was about the greater works, okay, the greater works that Jesus said, you shall do greater works than these. So uh, a simple way in which uh, it, it will probably be addressed then the via in the supernatural hour, but uh, briefly I'm just sharing. When we look at the life of Jesus, all the works that he did, okay, uh, so today we can see a greater measure, like in terms of numbers, you know, the, the work uh, that we can do for God. We can see more of those works being done. So that would qualify as greater works. And uh, maybe even some things that could not have happened during Jesus' times. For example, in those times, we did not have um, uh, medical intervention where uh, people uh, people were um, given metals in their bodies, right? Like today we have that we metal um, replaces bone, and uh, you know people are able to function with their bodies normally after that. Uh, but today that we have a practice like that, even something supernatural like the bone, the metal turning into bone. You see, so that's a greater work because we haven't. There was no opportunity for such things when Jesus was walking here. Not to say that, oh, we are greater. Or, it's not like that. But it's just something incredible, which we've not seen happen in the past, that can happen today. So those were the things that you know, Jesus was referring to as the greater works of God. And I uh, really hope that uh, it addresses your yeah. Okay, sure, Divya, you can please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. I just had a question uh, regarding this uh, course itself uh, uh, in terms of, uh, okay, the prophecy uh, in the Old Testament times, uh, just as you were mentioning, and when Jesus Christ came, he himself is like the fulfillment, right, of all those prophecies. And even if we see the New Testament, uh, we have uh, like, major uh, uh like in revelation or uh, even whatever paul talks about rapture and yeah there are some prophecies of those sort so uh, what what else is there to you know to be revealed like everything is laid out in the scripture so my question is uh, uh if if uh, just, uh, i just had this question because when you said that uh, uh, nowadays we will we won't need um, you know somebody to tell us or uh, which place to or in in those uh, you know small details of our life yeah we don't need any prophecy because uh, so i was trying to understand the why prophecy because then everything is laid out in the scriptures it is revealed to the end uh, so then where does this come in um, I, I, yeah, uh, I know that prophetic ministry is uh, mentioned in Ephesians. Uh, so, yeah, but I'm trying to understand better, like, where in it applies. Sure, Divya. Good, really good question there. Um, and as I uh, pointed out today, we are not just limiting ourselves to prophecy. But it's it's about the prophetic anointing as a whole, and as uh, we have discussed right now, um, you know we saw how the prophetic anointing is associated with supernatural demonstrations as well. You know, uh, hearing from God and speaking that word uh, caused supernatural demonstrations as well. So we are actually talking not just about uh, hearing from God alone, but the prophetic anointing. Okay, So I'm just clarifying that before I specifically answer your questions. Your question is, um, Jesus already came, uh, and you know he, he is a fulfillment of what we have uh, been promised in the Old Testament. Uh, and you know he has already revealed many things. And of course, we have the word of God. And as I was saying, the Holy Spirit is at work in us. So why prophecy? Okay, why should we um, even have this option of uh, God speaking through prophecy, a prophetic word, or through a prophet? So, Divya, even though we have the word of God with us, um, 
and we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Uh, you see, when we talk about the, the understanding of God's word and the application uh, of God's word for us to live aligned to the purposes of God, uh, not everything is clear, isn't it? We do uh, have questions, even though we read the word and the Holy Spirit is um, clarifying many things to our hearts. Uh, there are still matters where we need God to shed light. Okay, And if that were not so, God would never have given us this gift of prophecy a gift of the Holy Spirit. He would have never even mentioned it to us. But there is a place you know, for uh, God to speak through the prophetic word, through the prophetic anointing. And we need it. We need it. And that is why uh, it is still available to us. Okay. Now, having said that, I just want to clarify, the prophetic word is not above what has been revealed to us uh, by the Logos or the written word of God and the Holy Spirit who are in harmony. Okay? So they are in harmony. So the Holy Spirit will not, because we are saying prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will not pull in a direction which is different from what the integrity of God's word really is. In uh, 1 John 5, 7, we, we see this. So uh, there is a need. So that's my answer. That's my short answer to you, Divya. There is a need for, a, there is a need for prophecy and the prophetic anointing in our lives, even after we have the written word, we have Jesus who has uh, already come. And when we look at the prophetic word, the prophetic word will not you know, say anything outside of the integrity of the written word and the uh, agreement of the Holy Spirit. So there is a need for that. that is the reason uh, God continues to continues to you know release this this gift to us. Does it answer your question? Yes, uh, yes, yes, Pastor. Thank you so much. Uh, I have. Yeah. Uh, subsequent questions, but maybe I can ask later also. Okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure, Divya, sure. So, see, uh, though we are saying that the Old Testament practices are now replaced in a sense by the work of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, um, and of course, you know, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit that the believer can, can receive, we are not saying that God is done away with the prophetic anointing. That's definitely not what we are saying. The anointing still exists. There is a need for this anointing, the prophetic word, and God will be glorified. See, when we study about the gifts of the Spirit, we also see that statement, no? Where we see that the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit is for the benefit of all. So there is a benefit through the prophetic word in existing times, in the current times. And which is why God is continuing to equip the church in the work of the Holy Spirit, okay, through the gifts. And so let's learn. Let, let's continue to learn. And yes, uh, as we go forward, if there are other uh, questions that come up, you can ask. Okay, so... Uh, all right, so we'll move on then. We have about five minutes. Yes, yes, Divya. Uh, no, I'm just saying thank you. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. So, fine. So, we've seen uh, miracles and supernatural demonstrations mm -hmm. being associated with the prophetic anointing. Okay, so what else is there in the Old Testament? We see a concept called as the school of the prophets. Now, this is a very, very interesting uh, uh, concept. Where did it begin? It began during the times of Prophet Samuel. Uh, if you remember Samuel as a child when he was dedicated and uh, given into the temple, uh, 
uh, God spoke to him. He heard the voice of God. Okay, what is her hearing the voice of God? The prophetic. So Samuel is hearing the voice of God. And he doesn't even know that he's hearing the voice of God. But he um, had, thankfully, uh, an elderly, more experienced priest in the temple by the name of Eli. Obviously, he was old by this point, and he was not able to fulfill all his responsibilities uh, in the temple. But there were things that Samuel could pick up from Eli. And when we study you know, for Samuel, the Bible does suggest that this season that Samuel was in uh, was spiritually dry. The Bible says something like, it was not common for people to hear God's word. Okay, so Samuel grew up in a time when he lacked opportunity to be properly trained in hearing the voice of the Lord. Uh, he did pick up a few things uh, from Eli, and he, you know, continued to grow in these things and hear the word uh, of the Lord. But when he finally uh, came into the fullness of his calling, he established something known as the schools of the prophets. Okay? So we'll talk about these schools. Why did Samuel establish these schools? Maybe because he lacked that proper equipping. But even though some attitudes about uh, Samuel to really applaud, um, see Eli, he was old uh, and uh, he wasn't, you know, fulfilling all his responsibilities in the temple. And yet, Samuel, whatever he could, he learned from Eli. He did not despise Eli. For years, he faithfully served under the uh, mentor that God gave him. Okay? And God is so faithful. God is so faithful that God continued to uh, nurture Samuel. And Samuel uh, rose up as this mighty prophet you know, with the uh, prophetic anointing upon his life. And he started these schools of the prophets, uh, maybe with the intention that he wants to impart to the younger generation what he lacked. So in the school of the prophets, um, we know that there were men Primary, I think men, because I, I don't see any reference to women. So men who were trained to hear from God. So as you study uh, about all these people, we saw how there was a company of prophets. Where did this company of prophets come from? Likely the school that Samuel established during his time. And notice how they were carrying instruments. So he was actually trading them. Whatever he knew about the prophetic and the associations of the prophetic, he was trying to impart to them so that they can flow in a greater way uh, in the prophetic anointing. So that is how these schools actually started. So maybe people would have joined it, stayed uh, with Samuel, and gained you know, from the insights. So you see a progression from there. You see uh, uh, people like Elijah. Okay? And suddenly you, you notice that Elijah has a servant called Elisha. And Elisha is tagging along with Elijah. Um, and you know at some point desiring the double anointing, um, uh, which uh, Elijah, where did all this come from? It may have started from this whole training uh, that Samuel you know, gave birth to. And then it continued, it continued. So senior prophets would take on mentees um, and uh, equip them in the things of the prophetic anointing. Uh, and, the, and the next generation was able to mo flow more powerfully in the prophetic anointing. You know, Elisha, again, he had Gehazi. So who are all these people training? Training was going on uh, for the prophetic. Elisha called somebody to play a musical instrument. Training, equipping. So what do we learn from this? We learn, you know, many people would say that, uh, see, the gift of the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, then what are, why, why are uh, people trying to have um, schools? for learning about the gifts of the spirit or, you know, talk about any training, seminar, conferences that equip people on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it shouldn't be so, no, because it comes from the Holy Spirit and we have the Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit can train us. 
But you see here, yes, the origin of the gifts is from God. But man can play a part in equipping and training others, right? So believers can be trained by other believers or leaders in the body of Christ to flow better in the gifts of the Spirit. And here we are talking, you know, more specifically uh, about the prophetic anointing and prophecy. Okay, so that's the point that we gave. All right. So I've taken a little extra time here. Uh, let's go in for a break. We shall come back at uh, 10 or 2 and uh, pick up from where we have stopped. Okay, so please don't log off from the call. I can stay on the call. We'll connect back uh, on the same link. Thank you. See you soon.